Welcome fellow classic TV enthusiasts. Today, we delve into a rare gem from television's past, a captivating episode from the short-lived New Perry Mason Show. On December 16, 1973, audiences were gripped by the case of the frenzied feminists. In this intriguing tale, glamorous magazine editor Marion finds herself accused of murder after her boss favors another woman with a coveted job. Perry Mason takes on the challenge, defending Marion in a case that promises suspense, glamour, and a touch of mystery. Further enriching the experience is guest star Carolyn Jones, renowned for her portrayal of Morticia in the iconic 1960s TV series, The Addams Family. Jones brings her charisma to this classic tale, enhancing the suspense and mystery. Join us as we revisit this vintage episode and uncover the secrets of the case of the frenzied feminists. propose a toast to our bridegroom, Hank Carroll. We all wish him joy with that delectable, adorable joy of Montgomery. Ah, here, here. Here. And here's to the bride. I hope she doesn't kill him with kindness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you salty old dog. I can't imagine how you con that sweet, young, sexy thing into marrying you. <laughs> hey, I waited on her at the bank today. She is a hundred pounds of absolute perfection. Oh. <laughs> it was just as much of a surprise to me as this party is. After Edna passed away, I thought, well, I thought I'd be beach for good. And then when Dave introduced me to Joy. Oh, hold it, Hank. Nobody asked for a speech. All we want to know is, have you been taking your vitamin pills? <laughs> <laughs> fellas, fellas, you're going to have to pardon me for just a oh, moment. No, 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 no. You're not going nowhere oh, till you cut the cake. Right. I'll be right back. Oh, no, no. Come on, I'll be right back. Come on, come on, come on. hurry it up. It's hey, your party. Yeah. Mr. Carroll? Barry Mason. I'm an attorney. Hey, is something wrong? <laughs> I hope not. I'm here representing Brian Dexter. Mr. Dexter? Uh, since I was in Catalina on another matter, he called and asked that I contact you. Oh, he's a very fine gentleman, Mr. Dexter. I'd hate to cause him any trouble. Some problem with the papers for the yacht I sold him? Well, the problem is he gave you his check for $37,000 so that you could make a cash payment to the seller. That's right. Well, when he tried to take possession this afternoon, the seller refused because he had not received the money. I don't understand. Well, you see, I was tied up this morning. I asked my fiancée to deliver the cash, and I'm sure she must have just missed them. Oh, I see. Mr. Carroll, would you mind calling your fiancée? I'll be glad to wait. I don't think I can reach her by phone. But all right. Will you excuse me a moment? Yes, certainly. Be right back. Another 
drink to you. Hurry up, will you? What? You said you saw Joy this morning in the bank. Yeah? But what was she doing? I mean, did she... Well, she tried, but I wouldn't make a date with her. But Joe, please. Please. Well, she brought in a check. Asked me to cash it for her. Said you wanted it in fresh new bills for some kooky client of yours. Hank? Hey, Hank, let's get away with it. Hey, oh, hey, come on. Okay, Mr. Carroll. Charlie. Charlie. Want to sit in for some gym rummy, Hank? You owe us a chance to... You all right, old buddy? Joy's boat is gone. Did you see her? Not since this afternoon. Helped her put some gear aboard. When I came back later, she'd sailed. Where'd she go? I don't know. This is Jerry Strand, operator. I'm doing you a good turn, fella. I could get my rear end in a sling if the word gets out I tipped you. About what? They know you're in Catalina. They've got a hitman out of Detroit looking for you with a contract in your name. Desk, how'd I get off this island tonight? No way tonight. Just boat service tomorrow, sir. Okay, I got no choice. I want to check out of here in time for the first boat in the morning. It's okay, forget it. Well, at least let me replace your drink. Okay. I take it from an old campaigner, Hank. Chicks are like planes. One takes off, another one's coming in for a landing. Some of them must have came up. An emergency, maybe. I've got to find Joy. Before the police find you. That hadn't really registered. The police are probably looking for me right now back in Avalon. They'll send word on ahead. I'll look around, but uh, there's a guy at the bar getting a drink. Keeps looking at us. At least I think he's looking at us. He's gone. Listen, Hank. You aren't the only dude with a problem. In a way, uh, you and I got the same trouble. Except you're trying to find a bird, and I'm trying to lose one. I guess so. Of course, if I get caught, well, it's a pain in the neck. But uh, if you get caught... Well, Hank, what do you say we give it a go? Get us both off the hook. Here you go, thanks. And thanks for lending me the 50. I'll pay you after I cash a check and we get back together. Right here, keys and identification are inside. For the next week, you're Jerry Strand. Okay. I forgot. Joy's picture. Okay, Hank. Till next Wednesday in Oceanside. Oh, and uh, good luck. Thank you.
So, if I turn myself in, admit that I'm alive, they're going to say that I swindled your Mr. Dexter out of $37,000. And in trying to get away, I killed Jerry to cover my tracks. And if you go on being Jerry Strand, you know nothing about him, yet after two drinks on the steamer, you agreed to switch identities with him. What can I tell you? Excuse me. Mr. Dexter called back, Mr. Mason. He's agreeable to your representing Mr. Carroll, and he'll go along with the financial arrangements. Oh, meanwhile, he'll keep the whole thing confidential. Thanks, Della. Thank you very much. That's really a load off of my mind. Now, if I could just find out what happened to Joy and the money. All right. You say you gave her the check so that she could deliver the cash to the seller, but you never saw the money. No. But... I do have this. Now, this is Jerry's money. I found it in his trunk. That's why I changed my mind and went back to find him. I see. Jerry Strand had all this money in the trunk of his car. But he had to borrow $50 from you. That's right. That's right. Mr. Carroll, you left me waiting at the yacht club. You knew I was aware of the missing cash. Now, wouldn't it seem I'd be the last person you'd come to? I was reading my obituary in the paper. They said some real nice things. Then I saw your picture, that case in Catalina. And I remembered our talk on the island, and you were very decent about it. Mr. Carroll. Now, Mr. Mason, I know this doesn't make any sense, but what am I going to do? All right. You stay away from the cottage today. We don't know who was looking over Jerry's car, but... We can't have him knock on what he thinks is Jerry's door and find you there. I'd better put this in my safe. Will you pardon me? Please. Please! His story is so wild, it's hard to believe he's invented it. Do you think he's telling the truth? I don't know. But I'd like to find out. Put this in the safe. Then after Hank signs the Dexter papers, take him to lunch. A quiet, secluded restaurant. A long, leisurely lunch. Then maybe a movie. I want him out of circulation as long as possible. And where are you going to be? On a boat. For Hank Carroll's burial at sea. Hank Carroll loved the sea. Indeed, it filled his life since the tragic loss of his beloved wife, Edna, eight years ago. So we find it entirely fitting and proper, those of us who loved him, his friends and associates, should carry out his fervently expressed wish to be buried at sea. My dear, if you would, please. Just here. We wish Hank Carroll eternal peace. In the words of the poet, Twilight and evening star, and one clear call for me. I can't stand there the rules. It's got to me. Especially when it's a close friend. I still can't believe it of old Hank. That he, of all people, would run off with the client's money. Is that what happened? Oh, I can't swear that he embezzled it. But the thing is, he had no savvy about money. When this last deal came up, he didn't even know how to handle a cash transaction. I had to make the arrangement with the bank to cash a $37,000 check. It wasn't very bright of Hank to endorse the check, if he intended to abscond with the money. Oh, uh, Alice, uh, this is Perry Mason, Alice Burton. Alice Burton. Uh, Hank and I shared an office, and uh, Alice ran my insurance business and Hank's yacht brokerage. Couldn't do without her. Reverend Bueller told me Hank had asked him to perform the marriage ceremony. Oh, poor Hank. He was deluding himself. He decided to buy a honeymoon cottage. He even fooled Dave into throwing a bachelor dinner for him. Why do you say he was deluding himself? Because there was never going to be any wedding. It was all in Hank's mind. I didn't know anything about a honeymoon cottage. You've spent so much time in Florida lately. 
You had no idea how Hank was up in the air about that little tramp. Oh, I understood he was marrying a Joy Montgomery who disappeared the night of... Disappeared? It's a shame she didn't. Or even better, if she never appeared in the first place. How could she have the colossal nerve after using Hank the way she did to show up for his funeral? She's here. I heard you'd left the island. For a day or so on the mainland. When I read about Hank, I came back. I suppose you've talked to the police about the missing money. Oh, sure. I cast a check, as Hank asked me to, and gave him $37,000 in new bills. That was the last time I saw him. And it must have been a terrible shock. The man you were planning to marry, killed while absconding with... I wasn't planning to marry Hank. The marriage plans were all in his mind? Well, they certainly weren't in mine. Hi. Did Paul get off? I dropped him at the airport. He's on his way to Florida. Most of the names in Jerry Strand's wallet are in the Miami area. Why was Jerry Strand carrying all that money? If Paul finds the answer to that question, maybe some of this will begin to make sense. Did you enjoy the funeral? Yeah, more than most. On the way back, four pallbearers and Joy Montgomery got seasick. Joy Montgomery? But Hank said... I know what Hank said. She said she gave the money to Hank. And said she never even considered marrying him. I don't believe her. I believe Hank. It's getting harder all the time to believe good old Hank. By the time we'd had lunch, he told me every romantic detail. And he was so sincere, so plaintive. Tears came to your eyes and you knew he was telling the truth. As a matter of fact, yes. You want to be a cynic, okay. But I know if there were no marriage plans, not even Wistful Hank would have gone that far. Planned his retirement, bought a cottage here on the mainland. It doesn't make sense. Neither did switching identities with Jerry Strand make sense. But if Hank's telling the truth, then Joy Montgomery lied to me. I know she did. If she didn't intend marrying Hank, then why did she go to a decorator shop and select all the furniture for their honeymoon cottage? Joy did that. Joy did that. Uh, she was a very sharp lady with elegant taste. We'd already agreed on fabrics and colors, some very exquisite pieces. She told you she was the future Mrs. Hank Carroll. That's right. In fact, she said she was getting married soon. Never heard of any wedding plans. Was this the woman? I know. But you just said she was the future Mrs. Hank Carroll. That's what I said, but not this girl. She was a more mature woman. Fort Lauderdale isn't the happy hunting ground for every quick operator that comes along trying to make a fast buck. And what is this? A perfect stranger makes a telephone call and suddenly you're Mr. Hospitality. I mean, why? Because I'm worried about Jerry, and this man knows about him. I will bet you that this man is either looking for Jerry to collect on a poker debt, or he is a friend of Jerry's who thinks he's going to live off of us for a weekend. Well, watch what you say. And try listening. Well, with your mouth, that's asking a lot. Well, ah, Mr. Drake. <clears throat> Ice cold and ready to wet that old whistle, huh? Oh, watch yourself there, darling. There we go. Ah, frozen daiquiri. That's beautiful. You know, if business ever gets slow, Mr. Melise, you have a great future as a bartender. <laughs> ah, no deal. I'm retired. Deep sea fishing is the only thing I'm interested in now. Whoop. <laughs> now, about our friend, Jerry. Is he in trouble again? Does he have a habit of being in trouble? Oh, no, it's just that... Uh, well, you see, he's the uh, son of a friend of mine, and uh, since he died, well, I've, uh, I've sort of tried to look after the boy. Every time he gets in trouble with his bookie, he uses Howard as a reference. Seen Jerry lately? No, no, as a matter of fact, I haven't. But I've uh, heard him talk about you, and I was wondering if you might be able to tell me where I can find him. He owes you money, too, huh? <laughs> oh, no, not a cent. 
does he usually carry around large sums of money? Carry? <laughs> Here's to Jerry. And your hospitality. place inside out, I couldn't find a thing. I'm not Jerry, and who are you looking for? Is that the way you're going to play it? It's about what I expected. Collect call. 305-522-2000. Bill Smith calling. Relax. Hey, it's me again. Sure, I called before. I left this address. Well, the lady who answered. All right, all right, anyway. It's 5021 Beach Hollow Road. L.A., yeah. Now he's behaving like a real pro. Won't even admit his name. What name? I don't have it. Yeah. You're at home, sir. Okay. All right, go ahead. Number 79. Yeah, I got it. What time? Right. Okay, I take him to Lippy. No. No, no problem. I love to ride the train. You know, you really fool me, Jerry. Smoothest in the business, they said. Nobody would ever take you for a paper hanger. That's because I'm not. You've got the wrong man. Lieutenant Tragg, I'm Dick Bernstein. Just joined Homicide. Sorry to get you out, but we... It's all right. <coughs> Better take care of that cold. No, it's just allergies. I always get it when I get near the beach. I'll live. Who is she? Her name is Joy Montgomery. Her wallet had a driver's license, but no money. Who owns this place? Neighbors don't know. It was sold recently. Car registration is to a Jerry Strand. We've got a description. What else? Don't touch that. Fingerprints. Uh, sorry. I, I know you wouldn't. Uh, somebody, probably the lady, wrote a time and a number on that pad. Like maybe a plane was coming in. You know, a flight number at a time. Like maybe she was going to go meet somebody. Well, that's a pretty long story to get out of 84279 Frisco. Well, they're checking the schedules downtown. Excuse me.
What do you make of all this? Well, this is the way it looks. Lady came home from shopping, surprised a burglar looting the house, and he killed her. Nope. Sir? Look, when you don't know, say you don't know. Answer the questions before you give the answers. Now, the handwriting on that note's got a left-hand slant. The victim is wearing her watch and ring on her left hand, so maybe she didn't write the note. And if it was burglary, why didn't the burglar take the jewelry? And why did the burglar leave that heater door open? And the groceries. With the refrigerator and the cabinets empty, would a woman buy a six-pack of beer, shaving cream, razor blades, and chocolate cookies? And if that car belonged to Jerry Strand, where is Jerry Strand? And what do you make of this? Ashes under an artificial log? And why the devil was somebody burning cash? Put out an APB on Jerry Strand. Now, he could have left L.A. at 842, bound to San Francisco. On plane, bus, or train number 79. Attention. Attention. Amtrak train number 79 has arrived on track 4. Description checked. Amtrak train number 79 has arrived on track 4 from Los Angeles, Santa Barbara. Jerry Strand? San no. Obispo, I mean, yes. Salinas, San Francisco and police. San You're under arrest. I was just kidnapped. I was forced to get on the train. And he held a gun on me all the way. Who did? Look, I don't see him now, but I swear to you, there was a man with a gun. Hank, I've heard some strange stories from clients. But this one of yours, everything I've told you is true. I didn't kill her. You don't believe me. I don't know what to believe. Why else would you be running away? I was kidnapped. Hank. It's true. Like I said before, the man forced me to get on that train. Why was he taking you to San Francisco? At the cottage. He made a long-distance call. Now, I don't remember the number. He said he spoke to some woman before. Then he told of the party at the other end that he had Jerry and he was taking him to Lippy in San Francisco. And this kidnapper held a gun on you in plain view of pedestrians, the ticket agent, passengers, the conductor. And then when the police spotted you, this mystery man just vanished into thin air. Finally, you got the picture. The man that kidnapped me, he thought I was someone else. Jerry Strand. Yes. And I kept saying, I am a yacht broker. But he was looking for a paper hanger. A paper hanger. Yeah. Yeah, well, you tell them, Mr. Berger, we're on our way down. The district attorney wants to talk to you. All I can tell him is what I just told you. It isn't Jerry Strand. I wanted to tell you the man you booked. Isn't Jerry Strand. I just found that out myself. Who is he? Hank Carroll. I'll fill in the details downstairs. Well, while you're at it, fill in the details on why your client, or the girl he killed, burned up maybe 30 or 40,000 bucks in his fireplace. Why would anybody burn money unless it was counterfeit? Perry, you know me. I'm a simple soul. But even I thought of that. Treasury Department checked it out. It was real money and brand new. Who's the lady? My mother, very proud of my services. The city always wanted to see where I worked. Now, butt out, will you? Lieutenant, I just thought you might be interested in knowing about Jerry Strand. Will you butt out? I'm Perry Mason. How do you do? I'm Arlene Pagan. I, I came all the way from Fort Lauderdale. You see, uh, my employer, Howard Melise, and I were very close to Jerry. And when I heard on the television news that Jerry had been arrested, I, I flew here myself because... Well, Mr. Melise was away on a fishing trip. Miss Pagan, Jerry Strand is dead. Buried at sea as Hank Carroll. <laughs> Miss Pagan. Oh, my God. Miss Pagan, are you all right? She's not the kind that breaks easily if I'm any judge of women. If you were any judge of women, you'd have known Arlene wasn't Melissa's wife. I didn't know it. I said they acted married. They kept on smiling sweetly and sticking pins in each other. 
Dell is checking on the time Marlene left Florida. She said Melise was away on a fishing trip. That's why she came alone. Well, that makes sense. Melise went deep sea fishing the day after I was there. I don't know, he stepped on a fish lure. Anyway, the Coast Guards had to take him to Miami to the hospital when blood poisoning set in. He's back at home now, under a doctor's care. And inaccessible. Mm. Yes, Della. Yes, put him on. Hello, Mr. Wallen. I, I came as soon as I heard. Hank alive. I, I, I couldn't believe it at first. Listen, I've got to talk with him. You, you see, they're putting pressure on me because I okayed that $37,000 check. I'm sorry, Mr. Wallen, but for now, I can't allow anyone to talk to Hank. I'll let you know. Good night. Paul, if Wallen... This is the most confusing, impossible case. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. The people will prove that he lied, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. In fact, he left a trail of lies halfway across the state of California. He lied when he contrived to defraud a boat buyer. He lied when he ran away. He lied to Jerry Strand when he convinced Strand to exchange identities. He lied when he played the role of a dead man. Now the decedent, Joy Montgomery, she sensed the fraud, divined the lie, went to his secret hideaway where she confronted him, and there he killed her. Again he ran, this time by train, and when he was finally apprehended by the police, he tried one more last desperate lie by explaining his flight as a kidnapping. Huh. Now the people will piece together all the fabric of deception and will prove beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant, Hank Carroll, was finally caught in a net of his own lies. No, I didn't think it was exactly a lie. Please, Miss Burton, we don't want to hear what you think, but what you know to be a fact. All right. I know. Hank believed he was getting married. Joy let him believe it, and I told her so. I see. So after he had made plans, had attended a stag party, had bought a house, he found out what everyone else knew all along, that Joy had deceived him. Objection. Leading the witness, calling for a conclusion. Hearsay. And assuming facts, not in evidence. Withdraw the question. Prove the witness. Mr. Mason. Miss Burton. What did you tell Joy Montgomery when you learned that the defendant was going to marry her? I told her I thought it was a joke. She was all wrong for Hank. She just wasn't suitable. As compared to whom? Are you trying to say I was jealous of her? I'm not trying to say anything. I'm asking you a question. The answer's no. I felt sorry for Hank, but I wasn't jealous. Thank you, Miss Burton. One thing more. I have here People's Exhibit 3. It's an invoice from the Front Tom decorators. Have you ever seen it before? Yes. Will you please tell the court why you signed this invoice as received by you at the defendant's cottage? I have been perfectly honest. I haven't denied that I was fond of Hank, and I don't deny it now. I helped him furnish the place. Are we to understand that you were so fond of him that you selflessly helped him select furniture for the cottage he'd bought for another woman? Hank asked me some questions, and I thought he was hinting around. That he wanted you to share that cottage? No, that he needed advice in selecting things. Miss Burton, did you also help plan the bachelor party for the defendant? I don't know anything about that. You'll have to ask Dave Wallen. Why, sure, I kept the party a secret till the last minute. It was supposed to be a surprise. Then isn't it true that the defendant, who intended to be with his fiance that night, was unexpectedly not able to do that? Well, I guess that's the way it turned out. And she used that time to get away with the cash. Oh, I don't know that. Mr. Wallen, who introduced Joy Montgomery to Mr. Carroll? I did. And now, Mr. Wallen, tell me this. 
Did you ever visit the cottage purchased, Mr. Carroll? Well, I, uh, I, I didn't know about it before until till Hank took off. I didn't ask you that. I asked you if you had ever visited that cottage. I'll have to think. Mr. Walland, I do want to be fair. It's already been established the police questioned neighbors about people who were seen in that area prior to the murder. Now, did you go to that cottage? Yes. Yes, I did go out there. You see, I didn't know about the place before. I spent a lot of my time down at my place at Surfside. That's in Miami Beach. So it came as a complete surprise to me when Miss Burton told me that Hank had bought the cottage. Now, I figured maybe he left the money there. See, there was a lot of pressure on me from the bank because I okayed that $37,000 check. No further questions. The people call Miss Arlene for gone. No, I wasn't surprised when Jerry was missing. He was in hock up to his ears. I told him Mr. Melise wouldn't bail him out again, so I supposed he'd done the only thing he could do, just drop out of sight. As far as you know, he had no considerable amount of money when he left Miami. Not thousands and thousands of dollars, if that's what you're driving at. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Your witness. Mr. Gahn, you testified Mr. Melise wouldn't bail him out again. Are we then to infer that until this last time, he had paid Jerry Strand's debts? Well, yes. As I said, I wrote the checks myself many times. Why? I don't understand. I mean, why would your employer feel obligated? I'm Mr. Melise's secretary. I just do what I'm told. As his secretary, did Mr. Melise tell you to come to Los Angeles when you thought Jerry was in trouble? He was away on a fishing trip, and when I heard on the television news that Jerry had been arrested for murder, I thought he would want me to come here, and I did. Thank you. Is that all? Well, for now, that's quite enough. Uh, the people call Lieutenant Arthur Trag. So we notify police at every stop of Amtrak train number 79. And the result? The defendant got off of San Francisco, and he was arrested immediately on the platform by local police. Was he with anyone? Like a kidnapper? No, the defendant was alone when he was apprehended. You're with me. Lieutenant, did you examine the fireplace at the murder site? Yes, and somebody had built a fire in it. Well, you can see that that unusual? Well, this one was. He had uh, burnt up a considerable sum of money, perhaps thirty or forty thousand dollars. Who is he? It was the defendant. It was his house. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mason, do you move to strike that last answer as conclusionary? No, Your Honor. I'm quite willing to have it stand. The jury can make its own conclusions. Your Honor, that concludes the people's case. Are you ready to proceed with the case for the defense, Mr. Mason? Your Honor, the defense moves for the dismissal of all charges against the defendant, Henry Carroll. On what grounds? Ever since his opening statement, and over and over in questioning witnesses, Mr. Burgess contended the defendant's sole motivation in this case was money. So? So is it conceivable that once he had sole ownership of all that money you say he lied and killed for, he then built a bonfire with it, burned it in his fireplace? No, Your Honor. Without some explanation for that totally irrational action, the prosecution has no motive whatever for Hank Carroll to have murdered Joy Montgomery. And much more than reasonable doubt exists. Therefore, I strongly urge that all charges be dismissed. Your Honor, defendant... Your Honor, once again, we have an instance of counsel's well-known propensity for courtroom maneuver. We have been told that he holds in trust an amount of money roughly equivalent to that stolen by the defendant. How do you explain and... the burned money? That's enough, gentlemen. I'm... Uh going to give proper consideration to the motion. In the meantime, I'll declare a recess until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And at that time, Mr. Mason, you have the money here in court. I think I've been making the same mistake right from the beginning. I haven't been accepting the possibility that all, all of those wild, ridiculous things that Hank's been telling me have been true. 
If they are true. Did you check it out with the Treasury Department? Better. From a guy who spent ten years in Leavenworth for being an expert. So? So, he says it's A number one phony. The only flaw is the hair over Jackson's ear. Did you try the name Lippy on him? Well, that's when I got a bonus. Lippy operates in San Francisco, and he's got a contact... In Florida. That's it. The court will take custody of the money. I agree with you, Mr. Berger. It is a departure from traditional practice. But I've denied the defense uh, motion for dismissal, and the witness is vital to Mr. Mason's case. But how can a jury concentrate on substance when they're being subjected to all the paraphernalia of, 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 of show business? There's no other way to obtain Mr. Melissa's testimony without endangering his health. We've already determined that from his doctors. Pardon me. We're going to be uh, ready to go in just a minute. Fine, Walter. Well, I'm not against pioneering or new techniques, but I am against all this razzle-dazzle calculated to confuse the issues. Now, I'm sure your predecessors were concerned when clerks stopped using quill pens. This is hardly pioneering. Variations of this technique are being used in other courts. We're all set? Oh, good. Since the witness is unable to appear in person, and with the agreement of the concerned parties, I am allowing the use of electronic equipment in this courtroom to examine the witness. I want to remind the witness that he is under oath and legally accountable for every word of testimony, just as if he were physically present here in this courtroom. Proceed. Mr. Belize, we appreciate your cooperation. Oh, that's... that's okay. I'm getting kind of a kick out of it. You know, the camera and all. Mr. Belize, I'm going to show you Defense Exhibit A. It's a package of money which the defendant obtained from Jerry Strand. <laughs> Jerry never had that much money in his life. Mr. Belize, I want you to look at this bill carefully. Do you recognize it? Well, uh, yeah, it's a... Uh... A $20 bill. How am I supposed to recognize it? Try examining the hair over Jackson's ear. Is this the kind of bill Libby might call A number one phony? Uh, I, 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 I don't know what you mean. This police isn't true this counterfeit money belongs to you? No. Isn't it a fact that you had someone looking for Jerry Strand because he had taken off with this package of your counterfeit money? No. And that someone called you, asking for instructions, and you gave him orders to take Jerry Strand. Oh, look, I'm a, I'm a very sick man. I, I can't take too much of this. Will counsel approach the bench, please? Uh, Mr. Mason, we are trying a murder case, not a counterfeit charge. Now, I want to know exactly where you're headed. Your Honor, I'm sure that Jerry Strand was Melissa's paper hanger, a password of counterfeit money. So Stephen saw a chance to make a killing, grabbed a bundle of the phony money for himself. But there's no connection to Joy Montgomery. I can show there is. Jerry switched identities with my client so that Melissa's contract killer would chase him instead of Jerry. Now that's the line of questioning I want to pursue. Hey, will somebody tell me what's going on? Proceed, Mr. Mason. I'm going to advise the witness of his rights. Mr. Melisse, you are uh, advised that you have a uh, right to retain counsel and that you need not answer any questions which may be self-incriminating. Proceed. Mr. Melise, will you tell us when you injured your foot? It was the uh, 27th, I believe. Uh, yeah, the first day out on the Gulf. Fishing was great, but hot. I'd like you to turn your attention to the 26th, the last day you spent at home before leaving on that fishing trip. Did you receive two telephone calls that day from Los Angeles? I don't remember. The telephone company will, Mr. Melise, with the time and the length and the point of origination. Yeah, I do remember uh, uh, one call uh, just before I sailed on my boat uh, from a friend with news about Jerry just before I sailed on my boat. Mr. Melise, you're denying under oath there was another earlier call? Yes, I'm denying it. If there was another call, Arlene got it, not me. Now, I don't have to answer any more of this. The judge just said so. All right, Mr. Melise. If you won't answer the question, we'll call someone who can. Miss Pagan, that telephone call Mr. Melise does not remember. Do you remember it? No. Miss Pagan, if you're protecting... No, I'm, I'm... I'm... I'm protecting no one. If I had gotten that call, I would have told Mr. Melise about it. Is it not true that you couldn't tell Mr. Melise about that call because you learned that Jerry Strand was in Los Angeles? That he was apparently staying in a cottage he had just bought? And that he intended to get married? Oh, that doesn't make any sense. Doesn't it? When you consider that the friend... Mr. Melise referred to in his testimony mistook the defendant, Hank Carroll, for Jerry Strand. You were right. I, I lied about the phone call. 
to protect him. I did take that other call. And I told Howard about it. But then I found out that he'd given orders for Jerry to be killed. She's lying. She told me nothing. Order. Go on, Mr. Gunn. And as soon as he left for the fishing trip, I came here. I, I was hoping that I could warn Jerry before the killers trapped him in that cabin. But in previous testimony, you told the court you came here because you thought Jerry had been arrested for murder. Now you're telling us it was to prevent him from being murdered. Yes, I told you. I admitted that I was lying before to, like, because I didn't know what he would do. But now I am telling you the truth. Miss Pagan, why would you risk everything to save Jerry? Because I, I was in love with him. Is that why you helped him steal $50,000 in counterfeit money? Yeah. You ungrateful... Shut up! You're a fool and you've always been a fool! All right, Miss Pagan, all right. You said it wasn't that TV report that brought you to Los Angeles. It was that phone call. Yes. But it couldn't have been because you thought he was going to be killed. That wasn't decided until Mr. Molise got the second call. Miss Pagan, isn't it a fact that you came to Los Angeles because you thought Jerry had run out on you? I hope they... Bury you in that chair, you... You went to that cottage and you saw Joy Montgomery, the girl you thought Jerry was going to marry, bending over the money you thought you would help Jerry steal. And you killed her. I thought he was trying to use me. And I saw that girl kneeling there with all that money in her hands. And all the time... Jerry was dead. This court will be in recess. The bailiff will bring the witness to my chambers and counsel will join me there. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. Hank, the next time you decide to switch identities with somebody, I'll be a little more careful. Sure. Now all I need is to find somebody that'll take on a $37,000 debt, a burned car, and be declared alive again. And pay his fee. That's right. Your fee. <laughs> <laughs>